Welcome to this Game Theory lesson. This is part of the series Game Theory 101 where I am presenting lessons that I'm teaching my course at Susquehanna University and they're available all semester long. So please like and subscribe. Click the notifications bell and you'll receive notifications when the new videos come out. Today we are talking about duopolies Specifically, uh, we're going to be talking in this video about what's called the Cournot model or a Cournot duopoly. So duopoly is a market where there are two firms competing with each other. So this is a generalization. A, a duopoly, it's a market where there are two sellers exactly. It's a subset of what we would call oligopolies, markets where there's a few sellers and each has pretty significant market power. In a duopoly, there are exactly two firms, or there are two firms that have just a massive, con massive portion of the market, massive control over the market. You know, Coke and Pepsi, you see that on the screen. That's kind of a classic example of a duopoly. This particular video, we are covering Corneau duopolies. There's another model we're going to look at called a Bertrand. That'll be in the next video. So a Corneau model, or the Corneau duopoly. Once again, it's a duopoly, so there's two firms. In this class, right, we're talking about the introductory. The, the products are assumed to be the same. These, can, you know, these assumptions can all be relaxed. It just makes things a little more complicated. So the products are homogeneous. And the way Corneau models work is firms compete based on setting the quantities first and then going to market with all the quantity that, that is available. There are markets where this makes a lot of sense. There are some markets where this doesn't make sense. But agriculture, this really makes a lot of sense because the planting decisions are made so far in advance. The quantity decisions are made in advance and farmers have to make a conjecture. A conjecture. They have to make an assumption, what are other farmers going to do? How much product are others going to create you know, when they're making their planning decisions? So you have the two firms, you know, farming markets, there are more than two, but I think most of the time, but I think thinking about this and the decisions farmers makes makes a whole lot of sense. You're making a decision on how much to produce, then all of the products brought to the market and then sold, and the market demand determines what the price is based on the quantities that each firms have brought to a particular market. The conjecture point is incredibly important, right? Each firm has to make an assumption on what the other firms are going to produce and then figure out the profit maximizing point from there. And we will be figuring out a Corneau Nash equilibrium in the class. So what is indeed an equilibrium output under this specific model? Remember the Nash equilibrium, you're at a point, you're at a point in the game, you know, quote unquote game, these are market decisions, where nobody has an incentive to have made a change from their specific action. So a Corno nash equilibrium occurs in the duopoly where each firm is making a quantity decision and then based on what the other firms are doing, or I'm sorry, the other firm is doing, right, we're talking duopoly, there is, neither firm has an incentive to change their particular choice. Okay, on the screen you see a very simple demand curve just showing market demand. For those asking, no, I, I don't hire professional artists, right? I, I know you're stunned, it looks so beautiful. But simple demand curve, downward sloping, you know, and if you had a monopolist, they would see this entire market would all be theirs to figure out what's the profit maximizing point based on their cost structure. But we're not dealing with a monopolist, we're dealing with a duopolist. So remember the duopolist in a Corneau model makes a conjecture on how much the other firm will produce. There, that could be thought of as, right, there's some quantity the other firm is going to produce. And in essence, what it does is it cuts off the demand curve. So given the other firm is producing some amount, the firm has a decision of how much to produce based on knowing there's already a set amount produced that they're, you know, making the guess on what's produced. And they face this portion is really the relevant portion of the demand curve because they're not going to be able to say produce just 
five units and be up at the very top because the other firm's already producing some number of units. Each firm does this, and each firm is actually then able to examine what would be the equilibrium output. So the firm essentially then, just as looking at this relevant point of the demand curve, would also look at their cost to figure out what would the profit maximizing point be. Um, each firm goes through this process, and you can indeed find a Cournot-Nash equilibrium then. So there's a couple of ways analytics works for finding this. And there's an analytical formula we're not going to go through in this particular video. But there's an analytical formula that works reasonably well, actually not reasonably well, incredibly well uh, for finding this. But it's a little bit more complicated. We're not going to use the calculus in this video to show what that formula is. Instead, we're going to go through a payoff matrix. In that payoff matrix, uh, then we can find the Cournot-Nash equilibrium. But what is this mo model? What is this market? Well, let's assume there's an industry demand curve. Price equals 50 minus the quantity. So each unit produced decreases the price by a dollar. Two firms selling the identical product in this duopoly, they're competing by setting prices, and they've got to make the assumption on what the other firm is doing. Each firm has a per unit cost of $2. So using calculus, we could, we could solve this. But what we're doing instead is looking through payoff matrix for each of um, four possible values for each of the firm. So what I'd ask you to do now is go ahead and spend some time, and this will take a little bit of time. If you're in my class, really, this is, um, I don't think of this as optional. If you're not, a, if you're uh, just watching along because you uh, enjoy following along with this uh, kind of Game Theory 101 series of courses I'm developing, you can certainly take a shot at this. But what is the profit for each possible, of each of these 16 output combinations? I will go through one of them really quickly, and then I will show you the answers for you to go through the rest of them. But I'll, sh I'll go through the logic on what is done to find the profit on one of these right now. So for firm one and firm two both producing eight units, remember the equation is price equals 50 minus the market quantity. Well, if they're each producing 8, price equals 50 minus 16. So our price equals 34. I'm actually going to delete these other quantities so we don't get messed up with this. Um, the quantity total that's produced in the market is 16. Each firm is producing eight, so we say quantity one, and it's going to be the same for firm two, but quantity one equals eight. And remember, the per unit cost equals two. So what's the profit? Profit here. Well, profit is total revenue minus total cost. Right? That's, that's the, our simple profit formula. Well, what's the total revenue? The total revenue is price times the quantity the firm sells. We know the price is going to be 34. We know that each firm is selling 8. So the profit's 34 times 8 minus the total cost. Well, there's a per unit cost of $2 times 8 units. So it's 34 times 8 minus 2 times 8, or 32 times 8. Um, and the profit is $256 for, if, for firm 1 if both are producing 8 units. It's also $256 for firm 2 if both are producing 8 units. So this does take a little time to fill them all out. I actually think this is a really useful exercise, especially if you're in the class, because it has you thinking about you know, how, you know, stepping back to the idea that these firms are making money and what's the general profit formula. Now, in terms of what you fill out, this is what the payoff matrix looks like. Remember, firm one's profit is listed first, firm two's profit is listed second. You could make an argument that these should be zero at these higher numbers, given, you know, maybe the firm will won't lose the money. 
but just purely filling up the profit equation, right? The price goes negative, um, and and it, it becomes negative. But you could, um, or or that the profits are simply the loss of the per unit cost, not that there's a negative price. But everything, I mean, other than these negative numbers, which we could argue what they are, everything else here is accurate. So once you have completed the payoff matrix, you could check your work. And as I mentioned, there is a really useful way to do this with calculus. We're not showing that in this video. But the Carnot model is, is interesting and it's useful in some cases in thinking through how do duopolies operate. And in this case, they're setting the quantities simultaneously, competing by choosing quantities, and then they're letting the market forces do their thing in terms of what the price is in the particular market. So that's all for this video. The next video is actually going through a different type of duopoly called a Bertrand model. Hope you'll tune in for that, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.